when a picture gets to the levels that Fatal Attraction got to, not only in terms of the box office, but in terms of the national press, the media attention, the comments that were coming to us from people that we respected, and then the worldwide acceptance of this picture, it is not anything we could have guessed would have happened. I mean, it was a phenomenon. We have pictures that gross money, but a phenomenon, a social phenomenon. One of the reasons why Fatal Attraction was such an important film for the 80s was because of the timing that it had. It came out at a time when feminism was under siege. I was surprised at the reaction of feminists. And since I consider myself a feminist, I was concerned by it. This was the time when women were wearing suits in the office, you know, trying to emulate men, I guess, in, in order to get ahead. The women's rights movement um, for a long time um, fights this idea of women being portrayed as villains. It was astounding. I think the movie came out at a time where it just touched a nerve. The reality for me is that um, equal rights are equal opportunities, which means join the club. It never occurred to me there was any issue at all. I mean, this was a deranged woman. She happened to not be married and work, but I don't know why that made a statement about single women. I, I, it was totally surprising to me that there was any feminist reaction to it at all. I remember sitting down actually with Gloria Steinem and saying to her, why is everybody so upset about this? You have to explain it to me. And when she explained it to me, I understood it. First of all, Glenn Close is a single career woman. And this is one career woman. We're not remotely saying that this is all career woman. I, of all people, am not saying that. I never thought of her as representing every single working woman. She didn't have to be a career woman. He could have met her at the grocery store. This was a woman who was eventually psychotic, you know, and, and it wasn't trying to say that all career women are psychotic. It's lunacy, you know, but people were, at the time, the, you know, the feminist movement was quite upset about the movie. What I hadn't understood is that because she flips out, that that was going to be seen as all career women are crazy. Psychiatry and psychoanalysis simply doesn't understand motivation well. We look at things in the person's past and we say, uh-huh, this happened, this happened. But we also know 400 people who had similar things that weren't driven to the dramatic excesses of whatever the neurosis might be. The main theme of this movie is that sex is dangerous. And we see that from the very beginning of the movie. It's set up that way. First, Michael Douglas' character sees this guy with a, uh, a neck brace. And it's like, what happened to him? What did he do to his neck? He was screwing his wife. He... Are you serious? Am I serious? No, oh, absolutely. You should see his wife. He had to take her out on the stretch. Right, girl. <laughs> you guys. And then, even before he's gotten together with Alex, they're in this meeting and they're discussing a book. And there's a libel suit because the book is about a woman's affair with a politician. Well, strictly between these walls, all right? Did the author have an affair with Mr. Ohio or not? Yeah, she did. You go back to when I was a boy, you were always warned not to have sex. Why? You have sex, the woman's going to get pregnant the first time regardless of what you do, and you're going to catch an awful venereal disease. Well, this poor sap, the hero, gets the woman pregnant, and he catches the psychic equivalent of an incurable venereal disease, which is even worse. People try sex in films all the time, but there's some reason why, what, almost 20 years later, you know, 18 years later, we're still talking about uh, fatal attraction. The impact of uh, fatal attraction on society, at least in the short run, was like the impact of Jaws on swimming. Because if every man who played around at the office and a casual play around were forced to suffer one-tenth of what he did, my God, you would have, uh, you'd have solved the infidelity problem right and left. Why don't you have a date tonight, Saturday night? I did have a date. I stood him up. That was the phone call I made. Does that make you feel good? Doesn't make me feel bad. <laughs> the Glenn Close character is psychotic from the get-go. She was uh, somebody who had a desperate need for a relationship, would use anything that she could to get it, but she didn't communicate authentically. Delicious, seductive little scene that starts their affair is, are you? Am I what? Discreet? 
Yes. Are you? Yes. Those are flags that say it's okay for us to have sex, to have an affair, and it'll be a nice, you know, weekend in the country. And then, you know, hasta la vista, baby. No problem. She starts with a total lie. But in fact, she was saying, um, I want to have sex with you, and then I want to keep you. And, and then I want to occupy your life. This woman is created as a monster. Ultimately, she, she became psychotic. I mean, she became quite nuts. She is a almost psychotic individual. She, you wouldn't want to live inside her head. She is a very sad, troubled, distraught woman. It's really strange. I feel like I know you already. I just want to know where I stand. I think you're terrific. But I'm married. The Glenn Close character committed adultery with a married man. I mean, she, she knew what she was doing. She may have thought she could handle it. She may have thought it promised more. But nevertheless, she made a choice. Yeah, I don't think I like this. Like what? The way you run away after every time we make love. Well, Alex, what difference does it make whether I leave now or in the morning? The fact is, I gotta go. Well, you're not gonna leave now. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. I mean Please it. stop I mean it. Hey, come on. Hey, Alex, come on. Glenn Close, in another movie, this character, uh, Alex Forrest, would have been someone we can admire. We don't expect people to act crazy. Interestingly, most crazy people don't act crazy. I was just so fascinated by how somebody who seems so together, a man or a woman, and by the way, I think this occurs with men as much as with women, um, could so lose their sense of self when they're left. <laughs> it's okay. I'm sorry if I upset you. It's okay. It's okay, really. <laughs> The quickness of her conversion into a lunatic by slashing her wrists and the bloody hands is again a sign of someone right on the edge. Alex is a victim long before the story begins. I mean, she basically is a victim who's out of control, who needs help. I think the family was the greatest victim. The victim in this movie is everybody. They are victims of circumstance. I mean, maybe victim is the wrong is the wrong word, really. I mean, I just, I just thought it was life, you know, and life is unexpected, things that are unexpected. The totally innocent person in the movie is Ann Archer and her daughter, because they had nothing to do with anything. She was a loving wife and a loving mother. Many men I know would have loved to have Ann Archer as their wife, not because she's beautiful, but because you can rely upon her, you can depend upon her. Not only can she cook and clean and, and look gorgeous and have, has great taste, but when push comes to shove, she can kill the people who are threatening your life. She does not become a victim when she says, if you come near my family again, I will kill you. She takes control of the situation and fights back. I think everybody at the end becomes a victim. Certainly the family. Um, you have to wonder what happened to them afterwards. The fact that he was witness to somebody being killed as a result of his actions certainly couldn't sit with him well for the rest of his life if he were a real person. The ellipsis at the end of the script leads you to suspect that she will take him back. There's no reason to suspect that she will somehow now say, forget about it, you're out of here, pack your bags, we're getting a divorce. That's not what it suggests. When we got started, we weren't sitting there and thinking, Everybody in the United States is going to think this is about how we live today. We went out to make a really good thriller with social implications. We weren't ignorant. It really tapped into the frustrations, the anxieties, the apprehensions, uh, the disease, the sexually transmitted diseases, the metaphors for them. It hit everything. It hit all the right buttons. Hopefully people realize that, that when you sleep with somebody that at least, at least you owe them some contact afterwards. You just can't ignore somebody afterwards. This has got to stop. Dan, if you'd agreed to see me, I wouldn't have called you. You get it, all right? It's over. There is nothing between us. You mean you've had your fun, now you just want a quiet life. Why are you doing this? Doing what? You need help. Don't tell me what you I need. need. You need to shrink. 